Lord Barra, you are so welcome to Flop Culture. How are you doing? I'm good. I am obsessed with how you look right now. <laughs> like this is the fact that you're wearing glasses over glasses, a fur coat, tie high boots. The hair is blown out. The gold earrings are on. I'm obsessed. She's committed, girls. Because I should say, and I had said this on Patreon, I think, uh, in advance of this episode, we were originally supposed to growing up Gotti. Then it became very difficult to watch that legally. So we said, you know what? Let's make it easy for ourselves because you're a busy gal. You've got a book to promote, which we'll get to. What did you choose as your flop this week? So it's a debatable flop, but as Conor Bean and I were saying last night, it's not a flop to us. It's the Real Housewives of DC. It's only one season. So if you are like, oh, I don't know if I want to get into Housewives, but you want to watch one season, this is it. And it is so controversial because they nearly got Bravo shut down. I am a lapsed Housewives fan. I will say I got into it during the pandemic. So I've watched, I think I'm a season behind on Beverly Hills. I'm a couple of seasons behind on Potomac, a couple of seasons behind on New York. They're kind of my mainstay ones and I haven't. I know everyone says Miami. I'll get to Miami eventually, but I've been finding it kind of hard to get back in, feeling a bit lethargic. This, this could be the season to bring me back in, I think, because it's just, it's absolute lightning in a bottle. It's everything you want from a Housewives show in terms of, Good casting, mental people, a mental, you couldn't write a storyline except you could because it happened. It's just, what is it about it that works so well for you? I think, so it's Housewives before Housewives had massive social media profiles. Yeah, because I didn't realise, sorry, that this was only like the fifth iteration of, I thought it was way, way later and it was just like, okay, we already have loads of these other Housewives we'll franchises, so it doesn't matter. But this is only the fifth one and at that point it was only ratings wise and stuff it just wasn't doing as well as the kind of juggernaut anyway yeah it was like I, th- I think I, like at the time like you see in the reunions like one of them's like everybody's telling me they love me on my Facebook and I'm like screaming like I was I would never have a Facebook now because Facebook is, is so different yeah. so you're in a totally different time phones aren't out all the time mm. there is no glam like at all it's like you know the way Kyle Richards does her makeup herself now you're going back into that era um, so they take themselves a little less seriously from the point of view of public opinion they're more concerned about the other housewives opinion so it's like it feels a bit more real um, and I think as well they cast it very well and the producers are so shady in this I think the producers aren't as shady now they're so shady mm. so I just it's and also a lot of times housewives go in now because they're so aware of media and their presence in media this one, they you're just watching them and you're going, don't say that. Don't do that. Like, we can, like, talk about the big thing in it now. I think we need to get it out of the way, basically. Absolutely, yeah. There's a couple in this TV series and um, Tarek and Mikhail. And even though they all call her a different, pronounce her name They're all Lina. calling her Mikhaela. Mikhaela. I'm like, yeah. the whole season, her name is Mikhail. Even it's- when she's like, it's spelt like Michael. It's, like, so funny. And... They are basically, you meet them because how they cast a lot of these housewives is they, they kind of say like, right, who's the Lisa Vanderpump? You can kind of see, you know, who's going to be like, one of their taglines is like, I was born in this town, kind of like Kyle Richards. Yeah. So I can kind of see from like a production point of view, they're like, that's going to do, tick that box, that box. And then we had a couple who were like super flash and didn't, and a lot of people who are quite wealthy aren't that flash because... Mm. They don't want people counting their money, right? Like I would experience that quite often at work. Like it's like, it's not a wise thing to do. They are the opposite. They're like just spending so much money. So immediately you're like, this is a bit sus. But they basically snuck into the White House for an event and people lost their jobs over it. People at Bravo lost lost their jobs over it. They were banned from ever shooting in the city again. There was a second season planned because we were going to meet the adoptive father. We were going to see the fallout of the business. We were going to see the winery go under. There were so many plot lines for season two and everything got shut down. Cameras down, get out of our city. So that's where this season, at the start, you're like another housewife. But like by the time you get to episode four or five, you're panicking. It's there's so much tension in it that you don't, you don't typically get with the housewives. I will say, obviously, of your moments, but as you said, even these last two episodes, or as you're watching Mikhail Salahi and Tarek Salahi make their way to this dinner that they're yeah. supposedly invited to, which as it turns out, they're not. She's getting all her beauty treatments beforehand. You have, and again, you have the producers presumably prompting the, the hairdresser, the hairdresser asked to, ask to be like, see the invitation. Ask the invitation. And she's like, oh, yeah, I must get it. It's in the car, not to be seen in the car. They're, people are ringing them and they're like gloating about being invited. It's, I didn't realise it was as as serious as it was until you hear them describing it as literally a national security breach. They're watching them being interrogated on C-SPAN in the final episode. It's 
bonkers. It's, it's chaos. Bonkers. It's chaos. And then the whole time they're going, we did have an invite. I can't describe it. Like when you're like, even even when I was describing it to you saying it's controversial and it's crazy. When you're watching, it, you're like, there are no words for this. It is insane. And even afterwards, they're like, no, we were invited. And Andy Cohen is reading the email going, now an optimistic person may think they might still be getting an invite, but this isn't an invitation. And they're like, no. And they snuck through a kitchen into stuff. Like it's, it is insane. And it's only one season, so you can chomp through it. Like if you have like a bad hangover or you're like sick for 24 hours, you can get through that sitting in your bed. I was absolutely going to say it's perfect. If you have the flu, you need to just, this might actually cure you, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> genuinely, you're in bed, you watch this, suddenly all symptoms alleviated. The dopamine hit, the serotonin off this is unbelievable. And the clothes. And then also Beverly Hills was such a hit because you're seeing different women at different stages that are usually well documented for women like divorce, the husband leaving them, all that kind of stuff. So we've got one who her husband's the photographer for the White House mm. and basically he th- he's breaking up with her the exact same way of, of what Camille Grammer was going through in Beverly Hills. Mm. So you start to see that and then she announces they're getting divorced at the reunion. It is so juicy. You don't get that juice anymore. No. Like Beverly Hills will make up that a dog got adopted and like we have to watch that for a season. Whereas this don't is... Don't talk to me about that season. I still get, if I think about it too much I get angry. We honestly. lost a lot of good fans during that season. We lost a lot of people because of that. So like this could bring R. people R. back in. I know, Gone but right? never forgotten. I know. Who else do we meet? You mentioned Karamani. Uh, we mentioned Mikhail. Who else? Do, who were the other housewives that we meet? Stacey was great. Like Loved Stacey. Loved it. Now, definitely did not like the controversial take on gay marriage. So there's... Yeah. yeah. I, actually, I felt very this, disappointed in that. But this is... It's, it's a funny season because obviously there are these... with And you could say that with all housewives, there's these moments of total levity, insanity, you know, not serious at all. And then you have moments like this where they're actively talking about gay marriage and they're kind of having debates about it and as much as I think it's really important that that's seen on TV there are a lot of positions and takes that you're hearing and you're like oh my god like wanting to rip skin off your face when you find out that most rich women and housewives are Republican devastating and they have Republican (laughs) points of view you're like Crap, you know what I mean? I didn't realise that I was just going to see your Jimmy Choo's all the time. Mm. I realised that, like, we do not agree on some really core things. But she was great. Like, um, her husband, like, what a performance. He He's, knew... Br- he could be a housewife just himself. Just let him He got the be. memo. Like, he would come in and he would say, just say one line and then bring, like, whoever, whatever, because each housewife usually has a producer. Mm. Whoever was their producer just knew what to do. Like. Yeah. And I found her great. Her friend Erica as well knew what to do. I think yeah. in season two, she would not have been a friend of, she would have been a housewife. Yeah. And then you have Linda, who is like, so she's 53 and her boyfriend, who she refuses to mar- marry, is 35. Yeah. Handsome, tall. She is tiny. Like, you can tell like she's getting older and like we all shrink as we kind of get older. And then she's got the big bouffant. She's fabulous. Drinks scotch. Admits at the reunion that she's always on a load of different medications mixed to get herself balanced out. She's a bit crazy. Yeah. But she's kind of like, there's always one housewife who gives you like the what you're thinking in the background you know like you know she's saying well that's not a good thing to do she's kind of like the audience commentary she's that housewife and she's wise and she's a bit more removed from it um she was fab but Caro Manny like she came out after this season saying I needed to do a lot of soul searching after that because she said some pretty she was she's the British like the Lisa Vanderpump role the British woman in America slagging off Americans mm. And then just saying, well, darling, it's my sense of humour. People just don't understand me. I slow when I talk. She's from South London as well, South West London. Um, I've never heard that accent down there, but maybe I wouldn't be allowed into the part of South West London that has that <laughs> accent. Do you know what I mean? Maybe, they'd be, maybe they don't want me in there. But um, <laughs> she basically, like, I think, yeah, afterwards, and her children are, she's these two little girls. I'm not joking. You know, they say sometimes, like, children come back as someone who's already, like, they're reincarnated. Yeah. Her children are reincarnated from, like, I don't know, like, cruise ship singers. <laughs> you know, like, they are, like, this duo. I keep expecting them to come in in, like, a T-bar, a diamante shoe and, like, a feather <laughs> headdress. You know that song, like, her name was Lola, she was her a showgirl. Her name was Lola. Feathers in her hair yeah. and a dress cut down. To, that, that, like, that is her two little kids, like, personified. 
They are so funny. So like, biting, just. I'm terrified of them. Like usually I don't get terrified of kids until they're like teenagers and then they're like, you, you know, that kind of like. Oh, they, no, they'd scalp the two of us. They would scalp the two of us and they would laugh at how bad our hair are. Yeah. When they, hair is when they're holding it up. Like when they're getting her to pick something out, like one of them holds up her mother's dress and it's like, what about the state of this wedding dress? <laughs> and then when she's fighting with her husband, they sit on the chair behind her, like two kind of like bodyguards making faces at the dad as she's going, well, darling, you're always leaving me by myself. And they're like, oh, it's by myself. Like, it's like this girl group, like attacking him. Like they're worth wa- even just watching them in it. Yeah. But I felt so bad for them. There's a massive fight where they have to watch their mum be ganged up on. That wouldn't happen now. Mm. And then like the fact that he never said goodbye to them when they got divorced. Mm. Very sad. I'm sure they got their own back. Like yeah. I'm sure there was a few tires slashed, but they were great. I liked Mary, Mary Amon, but I... She's kind of boring. Now that I'm thinking, I'm like, mm, in terms of, she didn't have a lot of meat in comparison to the others, but that weird, the the daughter potentially taking the car or something that Tar- yeah. Tarek was alleging her of. What did you think of her? And sorry, the closet, I will say, absolutely iconic. Iconic. And I love as well how, like, from a, like a psychological point of view, she's making this massive thing about her daughter. But then you realise it's actually just her being like, I mean, we're so close in age. I'm like, you had her when you were 20. Like, 20 years is pretty... You didn't have your daughter when you were 18 months old. Like, there's not 18 months between you. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and she creates this really big deal around the daughter being the same size as her and wearing the same clothes as her. But in all the scenes, they don't look like they wear the same things, you know. She was a bit vanilla, mm. but you need that filler. In this season, you have to have, like, a really beige housewife because everything else is so chaotic. Yeah. Like, Mikel could have just carried the whole season. Like... It, it's just wild. And then the fact that afterwards, are we allowed to talk about what happened afterwards? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please. So you've watched this and you're like, the blood is pumping through your veins. Like the reunion, you're like, they, they want security, no one's allowed out. For, like it's just, it's outrageous. And then afterwards you find out, now as an Irish person, I think this resonates a bit. Like if you've lived in Ireland, you, you'll be like, oh my God. You know that song by Journey that they play at the end of every night out here? So Mikel runs off with one of the singers in Journey after this show. And like, this is why we needed a season two. And her husband ends up filing a missing persons report because she literally runs away with him. She dated him years prior. And then she basically rekindled her romance with him after the show had ended. Neil Sean, yeah. And and did you? they've got like millions of followers on Instagram. Yeah. She's up on the stage selling merch. She's like, we're back in Dallas. Get your t-shirts. Like she's, I cannot believe that she's lived these two completely different lives. He proposed to her on stage, I think, at a, at a Journey concert. Like, yeah. Oh my God. Like now that she, she's even more famous now for that than she was back then. Yeah. And then Tarek, I think, married somebody else. Yeah, they're they're happy out doing. And Kat, like, I follow on Instagram. She seems to be living a happy life. Iconic. Tarek was trying to. They tried to make an Airbnb out of Oasis, I think, with the new misses, and they tried to sell T-shirts that were like, "I crashed at the White House skate crashers." Oh my house, gosh. whatever. And like, apparently, if you went around, like he had stickers over Mikhail's face in photos around the house, unhinged. Oh God. yeah, no, like definitely unhinged. Unhinged. And like the kind of like you could see at the reunion when Andy says to her, "So you." you go everywhere with your husband and she just starts going and like crying and you're like oh no like is this like a you know like signal for help or is it that like deep that they are so codependent yeah. that even thinking about him gets her so emotional the level I'd love to watch it with a therapist like I'd love to be like what does that mean you know like it's I think their relationship is just such an insight into almost like control and they're trying to control the narrative around them as well. You know, she's like, I was a cheerleader, I wasn't a cheerleader. Even her illness, like when she comes out to say that she has MS, the majority of people were like, God, that's really sad. And it would explain a lot of the things that like when she was talking about like weight loss and stuff like that. Mm. And so most people would have heard that with a sympathetic ear not the fucking housewives. Oh, the housewives are all literally like, no lies, don't believe you, don't One believe you. One of them you. said, you only picked MS as your face, fake illness because it's your initials. I was like, I totally like, missed that, Jesus That is like Christ. classic housewives. What a mean, like it's A, it's just really mean. Mm. And then also it's just classic housewives. It's just delusional, mm. like the whole thing. But it definitely, like a lot of people are like, oh, that just flopped because they nearly got Bravo, like, thrown out or whatever of the country but I thought it was just a stunning season like Connor and I were talking last night like the insight into politics you wouldn't have that accessibility into politics now yeah and it was what made that franchise unique obviously because it's set in DC it's so different to any of the other 
settings. And that's kind of what I found. Like, it was that balance, again, of, like, the levity, the political stuff. It was just... It was such a good mix. It's just such a shame that it just imploded so spectacularly because Andy Cohen has said himself that he did want to do a second season when because when, obviously uh, in 2015 then Potomac started yeah. um, and when it was coming out Andy was essentially like yeah no it's not going to be political at all it's about like the etiquette they, they take etiquette very seriously it's a very different cast whatever um, he said I feel like with the uh, White House crash there was such a stink on it from those two referring to the Sah- the Salahis but he keeps calling them sal- the Salamis which I thought oh was my God. <laughs> Um and I know Mary had spoken about it after she said I like to use the word derailed it really derailed things the focus shifted a lot from who we were independent as people and contributors to DC and to what these people were and what they meant to us and how offensive they were but I, I feel like they like to play it down the the impact that you were mentioning there about people like legitimately getting fired the fact that they're not allowed to film there anymore like everyone it was really, dropped it it was big like. it was massive and I think like obviously if let's say we ran Housewives right which we will someday in Ireland I can't like, wait no like Brilliant. there's like five of us in Ireland you know our team who are already they're going to be Honor and you've already mentioned like we've got the, we've got the production ready to go we don't want to star in it we know who will star yeah. in it like I have like a like a full cast in my head for this you know what I mean if we were doing this we would want to move away from this as soon as possible Mm. so I get it like you'd be like okay like let's not associate ourselves with this and also the White House were like you have shown us to have a really lax security that is the the biggest issue was that they were able to sneak into somewhere where the president was having his dinner yeah I will say it is kind of insane that you watch them go up to someone with a clipboard the person on the clipboard be like yeah your names aren't here can you just stand over there for a second and we'll sort it out and they go okay and then seemingly walk in the yeah. front door and it's because they had a camera with them like anytime like we they, whenever I was working in retail they'll be like oh, like you're not allowed to let people see what how you could get away with shoplifting because people will just repeat it in an even better way. So like you're on TV getting shown how to slip into a dinner at the White House, you know, like, and like the Black Caucus dinner is massive and it is something that had so much integrity attached to it mm. that it kind of like, it was something that they wanted to keep in such high regard and it was so important to so many people that it felt like two white people were making such like a mockery of Obama and what was going on in the White House at the time. You know what I mean? Like I felt like they, a lot of people were so disappointed because they were like of all the presidents to feel like you could just march in there uninvited. It was just such a sour taste. Yeah. But to show the security breach, like internationally people would have been like, sorry, they weren't even like masterminding criminals. Like these weren't even like... They walked in. These are... They wa- they walked in. Reality TV stars literally walked in to a White House dinner and all they needed to bring was like a Bravo camera. You know, I think that's what... There was like a lot of embarrassment but people getting fired, I'd say it probably happened in Bravo as well but the White House staff got fired because of this. It's just... It's bonkers. Wild. Can we talk about the taglines? Yes. Let's um let's rate and review them. Okay, so we have Mary, I don't make money, I spend money. Thoughts? You would never do that now. Why? Because I think people now know like talking about your wealth brings the wrong audience. People want to know why, they want to find scandal. And I think as well like I don't, you know like I make money. It's just it's it kind of shows her character through that as well. Was a bit boring. Mm. Cuz that's a boring tagline. There's yeah. no spice. Like I'm not getting heat from that at all. Yeah. Well, which brings us nicely to our next one. Linda, I give people enough rope to hang themselves and the smart people don't. Wow. Terrifying. Terrifying. Because it's like, when I meet you, I'm already waiting for your downfall, Mm. you know? And I think as well, a lot of her power, even she's the only housewife I've seen at a reunion with Andy where she goes, no, that will not be happening. And Andy's like this, but I, and she's like, nope. So I think her sharpness and her threat is her superpower. She's very threatening in her words. Like she, I don't know, like I don't feel like she is very powerful, but then I feel like she is because she's telling me she is. Yeah. Stacy, DC is my town and I thrive in it. And she really, really loves being in DC. Yeah. Like her whole life is around. She's great for the insights. When she's sitting there, she's saying like, this is how DC works. This is how politics works. We do not flash like this. We do not do this. This is why we don't like this type of person. She's like a narrator for the DC lifestyle. Mm. So like she, yeah, she, she's like Kyle Richards. She's just so, she loves her city. Cat, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. Classic Facebook meme fodder there, yeah. Also like, Cat is at a stage of her life where she's just given up on a lot. You can see she is, <laughs> and that tagline shows it. You know what I mean? You can see she's like, 
absolutely bewildered at how she's being treated in her marriage. She talks about how lonely she is. She's sitting in her house all the time. She's on that. You know when you ever go through a bad stage of life and you're like, I know I'm coming to the very end of this cycle and newness is going to start. Yeah. I think that's what she's saying. I'm here for a good time, not a long time. I think she genuinely means mm. in DC. Yeah. And then finally, Mikhail, people have a hard time saying no to me and that's just been my blessing. The worst tagline she could have picked in her situation because a lot of people had sympathy for her when they thought that he was manipulating her. Mm. But then when you realise that she sets out to manipulate and even when he's, she's, he says on the trip, honey, you can only take one suitcase and the producers did her dirty and that. And then she's saying, I can take three. And then you know she does that voice and he says, oh, maybe, maybe two. And then she's like, I can take Two and a half. And it's like, you see how she actually does get her way. And then she runs straight up to him and is like kissing him and cuddling him. So, and when she's shaking her hands, they zone in on all the way she kind of like charms people. Yeah. So she could have done a better. She's so touchy feely with everyone. And it's something the other housewives notice. Like she she's immediately lasted. like, love you, pinky promise, blah, blah, blah. All up like this. You know what I mean? She wouldn't have lasted two seconds in COVID lockdowns. Like she's, her, <laughs> her power is overpowering you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Do you know what I enjoyed about this franchise as well is that the person who's the villain kind of changes throughout. I feel like when I initially started watching, I was like, okay, Mikhail's a bit to Lulu, but Linda's the villain. And then yes. you're like, well, actually it's Linda and Kat. And then you're going through it and you're seeing Mikhail and Tarek unravel and you're like, oh my God. And then as you said, you're kind of questioning their relationship and who's in control or whatever mm. and whether Mikhail's in this situation where she doesn't really know what she's doing. But by the end of it, firmly you're like, oh my god no like you are villainous in a way that I've never seen like you're a villain but you're smiling at me like yeah and also you're they make out that they couldn't be capable but the minute one thing I've learned from like watching Housewives for I feel like since I was born um, anyone that's like staying in a hotel you, you're immediately their producers always put that line in they always stay in a hotel when they're in DC and then when they go to buy they basically have this amazing scene where one of the housewives Stacey is an estate agent so I like I'm always like loving hearing the questions she asks and everything and she's like oh you're always staying in these fancy penthouse hotel rooms like thousands and thousands like when you did you see when they walked into their suite and it was room after room after room mm. but then you're not even buying like a flat like you'd have the flat paid off in a year like mm. they're paying they're paying hundreds of thousands for it and then the producers did them dirty again with them not being able to pass the credit check even though they're like we're buying for we'll buy for a cool 8 million and then she's saying we could have a 100,000 pound house or we could have a 13 million pound house and it, none of it's making sense like that insight into it was amazing but you realise that they are kind of pulling the wool over people's eyes even down to the estate agent they're not going yeah yeah I'll send over my credit I'll show my proof of funds like I have to do that in work every day of the week it's the easiest thing ever your accountant goes here's a screenshot of your bank account you send that to your estate agent it's sitting in there then you pass an AML check when they were going oh I uh uh I was like they're such bullshitters we are going to take a very quick break we'll be right back after this you touched on it earlier but this is obviously at a very different time for Housewives, like early 2010s. How does the fashion and everything compare for you, especially with the newer seasons and franchises? I love it because you're, people aren't wearing stage outfits. Like Beverly Hills, they're, they're wearing an outfit you know they're only going to wear once. In this, like they're repeating outfits. They're wearing the same shoe in many scenes. They're the Housewives I seasons like I love. I love seeing Bethany in like the same V-neck t-shirt and Real Housewives a few times. It's like if we were on Housewives, right? We'd be like, oh, that worked well. I'll wear this again. I'll do that. I'll wear my good shoes, like my good heels. I'll wear them to the event or whatever. And you're not seeing the kind of performative clothing and the pushing of the micro trends, etc. So the fashion in it now, it's got a really good time. It's the early 2010s, as you said, right? And I was working in Harvey Nichols at the time in Edinburgh around university. And what was really trending were these like satin tulip shaped dresses. And they're, you oh know that God. like, they were like, do you remember? And like, yes. like we, why did we dress like mothers of the bride going out to the club? Yeah, you know truly. what I mean? And then a few what years What was that early, about like? A few years earlier, then we were dressed like we were in an office. Do you remember like when Blazers. Sugar Babes pushed the button, came out? I was yeah. in a pencil skirt. Blazers, pencil skirt. I was out. Yeah, right. Sugar Babes have a lot to fucking answer for. I'll truly. tell you that. And girls allowed. I remember thinking I was like in a black shirt, black pencil skirt and a little waist belt and I was at an event and I just kept getting asked for drinks all night because everyone thought I was working there. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, like, you know, I remember just thinking like, I've gone too far with like the office formal look. But um, that, when they came in, Erica and Stacey come into one of the events. It's, 
I think it's the evening where they have the scrap in the hallway in front of the children. And they're both wearing these grey dresses, right? And it's really obvious they've rang each other and gone, what are you wearing? Let's wear the grey. And when those two silhouettes came through the door, it's the tulip-shaped skirt with the pleats along the waistband. It's like a shift and it goes to the worst part of your knee because it's hard to walk, it's hard to sit down. And when I saw those, I was like, oh my God. And even when they come out and do the taglines, Linda's dress, it's that satiny, silky, shiny look. And then Kat, she says in it and once, because Kat doesn't dress like the rest of them and it's not like, oh, because I'm pretty darling. She does say like, I haven't bought new clothes in about like 10 years, you know, that way. And I do think that's a lot with her husband as well. He's the earner and she's trapped in the house because she's not independent. Mm. She becomes independent on the show and gets a paycheck and leaves him, which is stunning. But like you can see the difference, like a lot of them are wearing clothes of the now. You know, when Linda's doing her poof my dress, that was just so in fashion at the time. It was peak 2009 to 2011 fashion. Like I don't know what we were doing, but we were doing something on repeat for the whole time. So I just love that insight into all the housewives have something like that. There's such nice time capsules in some ways to be able to refer back and be like, oh yeah, I remember this. I remember wearing this. Did you, have you ever this. watched OC? I, yeah, but I never finished out. So OC is has such cork vibes for me <laughs> because like, I don't know what it is, but like uh, in cork, like we verge on bad taste in the most, in the best way possible yeah. a lot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like even like I brought my friends to cork and they were like, men are so camp here like yeah. I'm obsessed like yeah. like my uncles would be like God you look stunning that's a stunning dress you know like and it, it's really like powerful and they're in a bright red pair of trousers you know what I mean it's like very flamboyant like that and OC is like that they wear you know those star top like the basically they're fully embellished jersey A-line shape and a pair of flared jeans and then a cork platform Yeah, like you know the, like that kind of look like and it's all that I can almost smell the fabric I can hear the sound of like the bangles like it's how size gives you such a snapshot into a time that we were able to wear our clothes constantly so yeah. we have more of a grow when we see them because I'm like oh that's just like a dress that I wore repeatedly at that time Yeah. whereas when you look at Beverly Hills now you go oh there was a month when everyone wore Fendi tracksuits. Yeah. But I never wore one myself on repeat. You're more attached to the old housewives clothes. Can you ever see Real Housewives of DC coming back? I suppose as a franchise standalone and also this cast in this show or maybe as part of another show. It's kind of a two-part question, but what do you think? Never. The White House, like, as we see in that franchise, franchise, they run the show. Everything's around politics there. That is like the... Geppetto of the entire city you know what I mean and for good reason obviously but you breach their security you're not going to be allowed to take up cameras again in that city I don't think anyway I think maybe if there was like you know a really flamboyant like even when Trump was there they didn't even like that would have been the perfect time to bring a reality TV series in he probably would have okayed it but I think there was just such damage done Yeah. and I think also I don't think Bravo would want to sit and beg to be on it either Yeah. like when you look at Potomac like, and I also think politics are very very, like, when you look at America now, I don't think people want to watch anything to do with people fighting for being one side or the other. I don't think we want to hear about it. I think it's so nuanced nuanced, and I think so many people are so heavily affected by politics now. I don't think there's a place for it in reality TV anymore. But like Potomac is like the way we get to see the same kind of like buzz of how they lived aside from politics. And it's an, like an excellent franchise. I love Potomac. Candace is like... I think one of my favourite housewives. Oh, just. She's incredible. And that song is a banger. That oh, right yeah. back song is actually good. It's And her husband is a parody for me. <laughs> like, I'm always like, this isn't like, this isn't real, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he's like, you know, like when you're like a teenage, a long, young teenage boy gets obsessed with like, you know, just being like really macho and stuff like that. Like, And he's in his little hoodie, like giving out, you know what I mean? I'm just like, what is going on here? You know what I mean? And he's like, how much was that bag? And I'm just like, <laughs> Like, this is crazy. Oh, And Portia's God. coming back to Atlanta. Yes, we saw that. That would be chaos. She she gets the memo mm. when it comes to Housewives, so she's going to destroy the place, I can't wait. All kicking off, all changing. Okay, in a nutshell then, why did Real Housewives of DC flop? Real Housewives of DC flopped for two reasons, I think. One, I think it didn't heat up towards until the end and then there was this massive bang and I think that's because they thought there was going to be a season two so they had legs in it. So it was a flop because we never got a rounded out sense of the drama. We It just stopped. It's like your friend is like, oh, my taxi's here, I can't finish this gossip and you're like, oh, deflated. And then I think the big flop was the fact that they breached security in one of the places that's supposed to be the most secure place 
in the United States and it flopped from like a security point of view as well as a viewer point of view. <laughs> but for me, I think it's an incredible, like if somebody says it's a flop, I'm always like trying to fight for it. But it, on paper, it's a flop. You are a best-selling author and your new book, Garma Goddess, is out now. Talk to me a little bit about it. Why did you want to write that book? Uh, I think it's like with Gaff Goddess and Decor Galore, a lot of it was so organically came about because people were like, at, it was stuff I was doing at work. And people asked me a lot of, on fashion because my background's in it. I studied it and I worked in it. And I think we're all a little bit disgruntled. Now, you know yourself, like quality's crap out there. It's hard to get good clothes. It's hard to get good quality. So it was kind of coming about anyway. And I, it's just like the same with Gaff Goddess. I was answering the same questions. And I was like, there's a book in this. And But I think in my head, I've been writing it for years. You know, it's something I've always wanted to do. Um, but it's been so well received, like at the events this week. Like I I keep saying like the like readers of these books are like friends I haven't met yet. Like we're all like on the same buzz, you know, like it's all like, like the, the same interests and the same kind of concerns and they we all want the same things out of our clothes, you know. So like it's not a book on style or how to look or what size or budget or like you're an apple. Like, you know, it's it's not that. Like, it's not the apple shape, fuck no, me. No, like Jesus I wouldn't Christ. listen to someone telling me how to dress. I'm not going to tell someone how to dress. Instead, it's more like here's all the info and then you make the decisions you want to make. But it's just been lovely. I feel like I've fallen back in love with fashion again. Like I left it because I couldn't stand the integrity of it because we were designing fast fashion. And now I feel like I'm standing behind, like every time I'm holding the book, I'm like, this is something that I've created in fashion that is going to do the reverse of what I was doing as a designer. It's reducing landfill. It's making people think twice about stuff and it's helping people get a wardrobe that's long lasting. Like I feel like I've kind of done myself justice in it. I feel really proud of it. So, And you should. It's brilliant. <laughs> I leave uh, a link to order in the show notes as well as oh, all thanks. of Laura's other books. Where can people find you otherwise? Where else are you? I'm Laura DeBarra on everything, but I'll warn you, it's just like my personal life on social. So, but I use Instagram. The most Instagram is Laura DeBarra and TikTok is more like hacks for the home. Laura DeBarra as well. Laura DeBarra, you're more than welcome back. Please come back because you had a couple of other suggestions. One, Amazon Prime, if you're listening, put Growing Up Gaddy back on Prime, okay? Because I would like to do that. We need to like definitely push for that because it's incredible. We could do an episode per book the next time you keep going. So we'll do Grown Up Gaddy and Daisy of Love was also on the list. So you oh need to come God, back for that. Oh my God, Daisy of Love. And we need to do Rock of Love as well. Yeah. And like Mob Wives was brilliant. But I think Daisy of Love, we have to, even for the push-up bras. And we could both wear like a big, massive push-up bra for it <laughs> and a trucker hat. I think what we should be doing, because today we've got Mob Wives yeah. to chat about this because we were doing it. But I think yeah. the next time we do it, we need to team with it. But we need to do that. Ed Hardy look. I'd love to see you in it. I had an Ed Hardy perfume when I was younger and I thought it was the <laughs> shit. It was like a big, and it had all the Ed Hardy colours on it. It was very pink. And it was, it might, it might as well have been petrol, but I was living. I oh my God, and it girls. probably was petrol. Yeah, <laughs> literally, yeah. My godmother got it for me. Shout out, Brita. But I'd say she was like, what, well, not a clue. Anyway, on a tangent, Lord Barrett, thank you so much for joining me on Pop Culture. It has been a fucking pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. 